The first part of our discussion today is that of phase diagrams. And with phase diagrams, what we're putting together are some of the concepts that we saw previously. Boiling point, temperature, pressure, and now we're putting them into a graphical form. What a phase diagram does is it shows us the present state of any substance in terms of is it a solid, liquid, or gas based upon the pressure and the temperature conditions that that substance is being sent to. So from that standpoint, that's what we're looking at. I've got pressure on one axis of the graph. I've got temperature on another axis of the graph. And we're going to see how those three phases are interconnected based upon those two parameters. Now, on a phase diagram, there are some important things to look at. There are some important pieces to know. One of those pieces is something called the triple point. Now, the triple point is an interesting phenomenon. At the triple point of a substance, what we have is solid, liquid, and gas all coexisting at the same time in the same vessel. And not only do we have all three phases of matter present, they're all at equilibrium with each other, meaning they all are interconverting. So there are six different kinds of phase changes. Solid to liquid, liquid to gas, gas to solid, solid to gas, gas to liquid, liquid to solid. And all six of them are occurring at the same time. It's a really weird phenomenon to observe. It's one of those things where, um, we have time later, I'll try to pull up a video to show what that looks like for water. And it was, it's really interesting because what you'll have is, you'll have the water boiling and a crust of ice starts to form over the top of it as it's boiling. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting phenomenon to observe. Now for water, this phenomenon exert, happens at really low temperatures. Um, so we're talking like, uh, you know, 0.1 atmospheres. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that has to be done in a vacuum jar. But you pull out the water or you pull out the air, lower the, t the pressure inside. You have water at just the right temperature in there and it will start to do that interconversion. So that's the triple point. Crickle point. This is a temperature and pressure condition that above which we no longer can distinguish between the two phases. At this particular temperature and pressure, this is the last point in time where we can actually see liquid and gas and, and see them as different from each other. Above this, what we have is something called a supercritical fluid. Now you might have heard of supercritical fluids before. Um, they do have some applications. Uh, one of the most common applications, supercritical carbon dioxide, this is what is used in some dry cleaning processes as a green reagent. Um, how it works, uh, how dry cleaning works in general, is you have certain kinds of materials, um, in particular things like dress clothes, that can't stand up to the intense environment of your washer and dryer. That's just too intense, it beats up the fabrics. They, they end up kind of, well, they get ruined. Um, but you still have to get those clothes clean. Most of the contaminants in your clothes, dirt, grease, sweat, um, other things, are organic based. So if you can't put them into the washer, what if you went and tried to dissolve those things in organic materials? 
Nonpolar substances dissolve nonpolar substances after all. Well, you can do that. That's what dry cleaning is. Using volatile substances that evaporate easily to remove stains and, and stuff from your clothes. But the problem with those is that those particular volatile organic substances are toxic in a lot of cases and flammable in a lot of cases, which is why you hear of dry cleaner fires happening from time to time. It's been a few years, we had one here in town. Supercritical carbon dioxide can do the same kind of thing. It's a high temperature, high pressure form of carbon dioxide. But because carbon dioxide is nonpolar, it would do the same kinds of things that dry cleaning chemicals would do without the risk of flammability, um, toxicity, and so on. Yes, we'd have to deal with the fact that carbon dioxide is not a breathable gas. So you do have to be careful about your exposure to it. But it works. And it's one application of, of this technique. So what does a phase diagram look like? This is the phase diagram for carbon dioxide. And we, we can see that for the most part, carbon dioxide exists as a gas. If I look at this big pink region here, I can see that the largest region of my phase diagram is the gas phase. The gas phase is always going to be found at high temperatures and low pressures. So it tends to occupy the lower right third of the diagram. But a couple of things to point out here and draw upon. First of all, one atmosphere of pressure is right here. And what do you notice about carbon dioxide at one atmosphere of pressure? Ben? Yeah. Okay, it's a gas for the most part. At colder temperatures, it is a solid. What is it not ever? It's not ever a liquid. Now this explains a lot for us. If you've ever worked with dry ice, dry ice is solidified carbon dioxide. And one thing about dry ice that you can count on is that it will not leave behind any liquid residues as it goes. Now sure, it will leave behind liquid in the form of as it encounters water vapor in the air, it'll cause that water vapor to condense. And that's what gives that cool fog machine kind of effect when you see dry ice in action. But the dry ice itself isn't gonna leave behind any liquid residues. It'll leave behind some small uh, chemical markers where the carbon dioxide gets trapped in fabrics and other things. But it's not gonna leave behind any kind of liquid. In fact, all that we see out of dry ice is sublimation. And the sublimation occurs at negative 78 degrees Celsius, which is why as soon as you see that dry ice, as soon as you open that cooler of dry ice, the first thing that you notice is you start to see that, that cloudy kind of effect because the cold dry ice is absorbing air from the atmosphere excuse me, absorbing heat from the atmosphere and it's rapidly cooling down all the air that it encounters. And so since a good chunk of that air is water vapor, we see that foggy kind of effect as a result. Another thing worth noting, the critical point for dry ice, or excuse me, for carbon dioxide, 73 atmospheres, which is a considerable amount of pressure, but not that much. Do a little quick back of the napkin math here. 73 atmospheres. That's about 1100 PSI. 
you can easily get that in a number of commercial tanks. In fact, you can get probably four or five times that in a lot of commercial tanks. So pressure's not an issue. Temperature, 31 degrees Celsius, that's a warm summer day. So it's not like we have to heat it to drastic temperatures to get it to its critical point. It's not like we have to have it at drastic pressures to have it at its critical point. We can see why that supercritical carbon dioxide has a lot of utility because the conditions that we need it to use it aren't too terribly difficult to obtain. Triple point, we see that solid, liquid, and gas all exist at 5.1 atmospheres of pressure and negative 57 degrees Celsius. And so out of this, I, I pointed out the three main ideas. Well, I want you to look at also the structure here is going to be consistent. Solids are going to occupy the areas that have the highest pressure and the lowest temperatures. And that should make sense, right? It's the most condensed phase. So we need conditions that are going to force those particles to really be close together. High pressure puts them in close conditions. Low temperature makes sure that they can't escape from those close conditions and become a liquid. Gases tend to occupy the higher temperatures and the lower pressures, because if we increase that pressure, eventually the molecules are gonna get close enough to each other that they're gonna condense and form a liquid or a solid. Liquids kind of sit here in the middle. They have moderate temperatures, moderate pressures. They're kind of stuck in the middle. And then the supercritical area, well, that's defined by what the critical point is. Cr supercritical is always going to be to the top right of that critical point. So what kind of questions can we ask you about a phase diagram? Well, most of them stem from the graphical analysis, the interpretation of that diagram. So let's look at number one. What is the expected phase of matter for carbon dioxide at 10 atmospheres of pressure and negative 80 degrees Celsius? So we're going 10 atmospheres, negative 80 degrees Celsius. To answer this question, we just need to look at the phase diagram. And we can draw lines. 10 atmospheres, that's right there. Negative 80, that's right there. Lines aren't straight, but in this case, it doesn't matter because we can clearly see that the two intersect in the solid region. So our answer here solid. Name one set of conditions where carbon dioxide will freeze or melt. Now keep in mind, freezing and melting are going to occur at the same time if we are at a melting point or a, or a freezing point. So long as we maintain that same temperature, both conversions are happening at the same time. It's only when we start to go above that temperature or below that temperature, that one of those two processes ultimately starts to take over and dominate that conversion. So 
Go back to our diagram. We are looking in particular at this line, this blue line. To answer this question, we need to pick a set of conditions anywhere on that blue line. So it really doesn't matter where, we just need to kind of pick one. Uh, let's pick on 10 atmospheres here. And I'm gonna draw down. So I've got to estimate, it's somewhere between negative 60 and negative 40. Um, it's definitely shading toward the negative 60. So best estimate. negative 55 degrees Celsius. Final question we've already answered. Why don't we see liquid carbon dioxide when we use dry ice? Well, again, if we look at our phase diagram, we exist at one atmosphere of pressure. And at one atmosphere of pressure, At one atmosphere of pressure, we never cross over into liquid. The only two phases that exist at, at one atmosphere are solid at low temperatures and gas at high temperatures. All right, any questions about those three? Okay, this is the phase diagram for water. Now notice there is some difference, but there's a lot of similarity as well. If we're looking at roughly the same region, we see that for water, just like we saw for carbon dioxide, the gas phase is the much larger area. Now our scales are a little bit different here. But if we continued on, we would see that the gas phase is gonna be the largest. And that's really the case for pretty much any object. If we get to high, high enough temperatures, low enough pressures, we're gonna see most gases form from liquids and solids. Couple of key points. First of all, one atmosphere, Normal pressure allows us to define our melting point at zero and our boiling point at 100. We can also see that our triple point for this particular substance, water, occurs pretty close to the freezing point in terms of temperature, 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. Pressure is considerably lower though, 0 0.006 atmospheres. So six one thousandths of an atmosphere, which again, doing a little bit of your uh, math here, would be about point, point 0.09 PSI. Barely enough to really register on any kind of gauge. Uh, so this experiment has to be done in, in a closed environment, in a, um, in a bell jar or some kind of vacuuming device. Water does have a supercritical point. It's not one that we can easily obtain. 374 degrees Celsius is hot, much hotter than we can withstand. 218 atmospheres is a lot of pressure. Um, it's about three, it's about 3,200 PSI. Certainly we could, we have tanks that are capable of holding that kind of pressure, but it's not something that we could sustain very well, very easily. It's certainly not as attainable as carbon dioxide was. 
Why the differences? Why is carbon dioxide so different in terms of its critical point, in terms of its phase diagram compared to water? Well, the main answer is intermolecular forces. I want you to look at one thing. We did say that the gas region was, you know, the largest. Look how big the liquid region is though. This liquid region for water is much larger than the liquid region for carbon dioxide. Why is that so? The intermolecular forces in water are greater than those of carbon dioxide. And one thing that we know about intermolecular forces is that they allow a liquid to stay a liquid longer because they're gonna lower that vapor pressure, which means I need more temperature to get it to get up to the boiling point. And because of their stick to because they stick together so well, they're going to exceed, or excuse me, succeed in forming liquids way earlier than other substances. Their attraction to each other means that it's not gonna require nearly as high of a pressure to get them to force to be with each other. And it's gonna require a lot more temperature to get them to go out of that. So as a result, we get a big liquid region and a relatively small solid region by comparison. All right, let you try this. Now, if you have your uh, lecture packets, this is gonna be a little bit easier for you to do. Because uh, you can just flip to it directly. If you don't, um, we'll go through these kind of one by one. What I want you to do is at, answer these three questions given that phase diagram on the previous slide. What is one set of conditions where we will see boiling other than at one atmosphere? And what temperature will that be? Where will we see sublimation, ice going to water vapor, as opposed to ice going to liquid water? And if we start at one at point one atmospheres and negative 100 Celsius, what's gonna happen to that water as it goes up all the way to 300 Celsius? <coughs> so again, if you have your packets, go ahead and just kind of flip onto the previous slide and look at it. Otherwise, I'm gonna throw it over here. And see if I can't. Give me a non-normal boiling point. Number two, give me a set of conditions for sublimation. Number three, describe what happens to the water as it traverses that line 
at 0.1 atmosphere. All right, in number one here, in number one, finding a boiling point, most of you are on the right track. We need to find anything on this red line. So the probably the most difficult thing on that is just estimating what the temperature is because the scale on this graph is just absurd in terms of you know this much means 100 degrees so your estimates are going to be kind of wide in variety in number two sublimation conditions we're looking for anything on this green line and so what that means is that we have to pick on something that is 
below the triple point in terms of pressure. If we choose anything above the triple point in terms of pressure, we're gonna see a small transition to the liquid phase before the gas phase, and that's not sublimation. So walking around, I saw some of you chose 0.01 as the pressure. If you choose 0.01 as the pressure, again, follow the line here, you're gonna see that you go through that blue zone in the middle. You have to choose something below that triple point. So the most obvious answer there is to pick on 0.001 atmospheres and then draw down. And so, and your answer is gonna vary here, but somewhere between 10 and 25, negative 10 and negative 25 degrees Celsius, that's, that's where you are. In number three, at point one atmospheres, again, we're above the triple point, so we're gonna see both transitions take place. We're gonna see the solid turn into a liquid. We're gonna see the liquid turn into a gas. If we were asked, we could fine tune it a little bit further and talk about, okay, the solid is going to melt right around zero degrees, maybe just a little bit above. And the liquid is going to boil uh, somewhere around 50 degrees. And that's what we could talk about. All right, any questions with this example? Well, that's chapter six. I W fate, I W, uh, Phase diagram experts, you should have uh, no problems whatsoever going through and doing that uh, activity in the post lecture.